watching the History Fire Channel. In today's video, we're going to be looking at Edward I. Born in June 1239 at Westminster, Edward was named by his father Henry III after the last Anglo-Saxon king, Edward the Confessor. Edward's parents were renowned for their patronage of the arts. His mother Eleanor of Provence encouraged Henry III to spend money on the arts, which included the rebuilding of Westminster Abbey. As a result, Edward received a disciplined education, reading and writing in Latin and French, with training in the arts, sciences and music. In 1254, Edward travelled to Spain for an arranged marriage at the age of 15 to nine-year-old Eleanor of Castile. Just before Edward's marriage, Henry III gave him the Duchy of Gascony, one of the few remnants of the once vast French possessions of the English Angevin kings. Gascony was part of a package which included parts of Ireland, the Channel Islands and the King's lands in Wales to provide an income for Edward. Edward then spent a year in Gascony studying its administration. Edward spent his young adulthood learning harsh lessons from Henry III's failures as a king, culminating in a civil war which he fought to defend his father. Henry's ill-judged and expensive intervention into Sicilian affairs failed and aroused the anger of powerful barons, including Henry's brother-in-law, Simon de Montfort. Bankrupt and threatened with excommunication, Henry was forced to agree the provisions of Oxford in 1258, under which his debts were paid in exchange for substantial reforms. A great council of 24, partly nominated by the barons, assumed the functions of the king's council. Henry repudiated the provisions in 1261 and sought the help of the king, French king, Louis. This was the only time Edward was tempted to side with his charismatic and politically ruthless godfather, Simon de Montfort. He supported holding a parliament in his father's absence. However, by the time Louis decided to side with Henry in the dispute, and civil war broke out in England in 1263, Edward had returned to his father's side and became de Montfort's greatest enemy. After winning the Battle of Luz in 1264, de Montfort summoned the Great Parliament in 1265. This was the first time cities and burghs sent representatives to the Parliament in May 1265, Edward escaped from the tight supervision whilst hunting. On the 4th of August, Edward and his allies outmaneuvered de Montfort in a savage battle at Evesham. De Montfort predicted his own defeat and death. Let us commend our souls to God, because our bodies are theirs. They are approaching wisely. They learned this from me. At the end of the Civil War, Edward worked hard at social and political reconciliation between his father and the rebels, and by 1267 the realm had been pacified. In April 1270, Parliament agreed an unprecedented levy of one twentieth of every citizen's goods and possessions to finance Edward's crusade to the Holy Lands. Edward left England in August 1270 to join the highly respected French King Louis on the crusade. At a time when popes were using the crusading ideal to further their own political ends in Italy and elsewhere, Edward and King Louis were the last crusaders in the medieval tradition of aiming to recover the Holy Lands. Louis, though, <clears throat> Louis, though, 
Louis, though, died of the plague in Tunis, before Edward's arrival, and the French forces were bought off from pursuing their campaign. Edward decided to continue regardless. By the blood of God, though all my fellow soldiers and countrymen desert me, I will enter Acre, and I will keep my word and my oath to the death. Edward arrived in Acre in May 1271 with 1,000 knights. His crusade was to prove an anticlimax, though. Edward's small force limited, limited, limited him to the relief of Acre and a handful of raids. <coughs> the divisions amongst the international force of Christian crusaders led to Edward's compromised truce with the Babers. In June 1272, Edward survived a murder attempt by an assassin and left for Sicily later in the year. He was never to return on crusade. Meanwhile, Henry III died on the 16th of November, 1272. Edward succeeded to the throne without opposition. Given his track record in military ability and his pr proven determination to give peace to the country, enhanced his by his magnificent exploits on crusade. In Edward's absence, a proclamation in his name declared that he had succeeded by hereditary right and the barons swore allegiance to him. Edward finally arrived in London in August 1274 and was crowned at Westminster Abbey. Aged 35, he was a veteran warrior a leader with energy and vision, and with a formidable temper. Edward was determined to enforce English king's claims to primacy in the British Isles. The first part of his reign was dominated by Wales. At that time, Wales consisted of a number of disunited small Welsh princedoms. The South Welsh princes were in, in any uneasy alliance with the Marcher Lords against the Northern Welsh based in the rocky wilds of Gwynedd. Under the strong leadership of Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, Prince of Gwynedd, in 1247 under the Treaty of Woodstock, Llewellyn had agreed that he held North Wales in fee to the English King. By 1272, Llewellyn had taken advantage of the English civil wars to consolidate his position, and the Peace of Montgomery, 1267, had confirmed his title as the Prince of Wales and recognised his conquests. However, Llewellyn maintained the rights of his Principality were entirely separate from the rights of England. He did not attend Edward's coronation and refused to do homage. Finally, in 1277, Edward decided to fight Llewellyn as a rebel and a disturber of the peace and quickly defeated him. War broke out again in 1282 when Llewellyn joined his brother David in rebellion. Edward's determination, military experience and skilful use of ships brought from England for the deployment along the North Welsh coast drove Llewellyn back into the mountains of North Wales. The death of Llewellyn in a chance battle in 1282 and the subsequent execution of his brother David effectively ended attempts at Welsh independence. Under the Statute of Wales of 1284, Wales was brought into the English legal framework and the shire system was extended. In the same year, a son was born in Wales to Edward and Queen Eleanor. <coughs> also named Edward, this future king was proclaimed the first English Prince of Wales in 1301. 
the Welsh campaign had produced one of the largest armies ever assembled by an English king. Some 15,000 infantry, including 9,000 Welsh and a Cascan contingent, the army was a formidable combination of heavy Anglo-Norman cavalry and Welsh archers, whose longbow skills laid the foundations of later military victories in France, such as that, that at Agincourt. As symbols of his military strength and political authority, Edward spent some £80,000 on a network of castles and lesser strongholds in North Wales employing a workforce of up to 3,500 men drawn from all over England. Some castles, such as Conwy and Carnarvon, remain in their ruined layouts today as examples of fortresses integrated with fortified towns. Edward's campaign in Wales was based on this de determination to ensure peace and extend royal authority. It had broad support in England. Edward saw the need to widen the support among lesser landowners and the merchants and traders of the towns. The campaigns in Wales, France and Scotland left Edward deeply in debt and the taxation required to meet those debts meant in rolling national support for his policies. To raise money, Edward summoned Parliament. Up to 1286, he summoned parliaments twice a year. In 1295, when money was needed to wage war against Philip of France, who had confiscated the Duchy of Cascany, Edward summoned the most comprehensive assembly ever summoned in England. This became known as the Model Parliament, for it represented various estates, barons, clergy and knights, and townspeople. By the end of the Edward's reign, Parliament usually contained representatives of all these estates. Edward used his royal authority to establish the rights of the crown at the expense of the traditional feuding privileges, to promote the uniform administration of justice, to raise income to meet the costs of war and government, and to codify the legal system. In doing so, this method emphasised the role of Parliament and the common law. With the able help of his Chancellor, Robert Burnell, Bishop of Bath and Wells, Edward introduced much new legislation. He began by commissioning a thorough survey of local government, which not only defined royal rights and possessions, but also revealed administrative abuses. The first statute of Westminster in 1275 codified 51 existing laws, many originating from the Magna Carta, covering areas ranging from extortion by royal officers, lawyers and bailiffs, methods of procedure in civil and criminal cases, to freedom of elections. Edward's first Parliament also enacted legislation on wool, England's most important export at the time. At the request of the merchants, Edward was given a customs grant on wool and hides, which amounted to nearly £10,000 a year. Edward also obtained income from the licence fees imposed by the Statute of Mortmain in 1279 under which gifts of land to the church, often made to evade death duties, had to have a royal licence. The statutes of Gloucester and Quo Warranto attempted to define and regulate feudal jurisdictions, which were an obstacle to royal authority and to a uniform system of justice for all. The statute of Winchester codified the policy of system for preserving public order. Other statutes had a long-term effect on land law and on the feudal framework in England. The second statute of Westminster in 1285 restricted the alienation of land and kept entitled estates within families. 
tenants were only tenants for life and not able to sell the property to others. The third statute of Westminster, or Quora Emptoris 1290, stops subfudication in which tenants of land belonging to the king or to barons subcontracted their properties and related feudal services. Edward's assertion that the King of Scotland owed feudal allegiance to him and the embittered Anglo-Scottish relations leading to war which followed were to overshadow the rest of Edward's reign in what was to become known as the Great Cause. Under a treaty of 1174, William the Lion of Scotland had become the vassal to Henry II, but in 1189 Richard I had absolved William from his allegiance. Intermarriage between the English and Scottish royal houses promoted peace between the two countries, until the premature death of Alexander III in 1286. In 1290's granddaughter and heiress, Margaret the Maid of Norway, she was pledged to be married to Edward's then only surviving son, Edward of Carnarvon, also died. For Edward, this dynastic blow was made worse by the death in the same year of his much-loved wife, Helena. In the absence of an obvious heir to the Scottish throne, the disunited Scottish magnates invited Edward to, de to determine the dispute. In order to gain acceptance of his authority in reaching a verdict, Edward sought and obtained recognition from the rival claimants that he had the sovereign lordship of Scotland and the right to determine our several pretensions. In November 1292, Edward and his 104 assessors gave the whole kingdom to John Balliol, or Balliol as the claimant closest to the royal line. Balliol duly swore loyalty to Edward and was crowned at Scone. John Balliol's position proved difficult though. Edward insisted that Scotland was not independent and he, as Sovereign Lord, had the right to hear in England appeals against Balliol's judgments in Scotland. In 1294, Balliol lost the authority amongst Scottish magnates by going to Westminster after receiving a summons from Edward. The magnates decided to seek allies in France and concluded the old alliance with France then at war with England over the Duchy of Gascony. An alliance which was to influence Scottish history for the next 300 years. In March 1296, having failed to negotiate a settlement, the English, led by Edward, sacked the city of Berwick upon the River Tweed. Balliol formally renounced his homage to Edward in April 1296. Speaking of grievous and intolerable injuries, for instance, by summoning us outside our realm, as your own whim dictated, and so we renounce the fealty and homage which we have done to you. Pausing to design and start the rebuilding of Berwick as the financial capital of the country, Edward's forces overran remaining Scottish resistance. Scots leaders were taken hostage and Edinburgh Castle, amongst others, was seized. Balliol surrendered his realm and spent the rest of his life in exile in England and Normandy. Having humiliated Balliol, Edward's insensitive policies in Scotland continued. He, he appointed a trio of Englishmen to run the country. Edward had the Stone of Schoon, also known as the Stone of Destiny, on which Scottish sovereigns had been crowned, removed to London and subsequently placed in the coronation chair in Westminster Abbey. 
where it remained until it was returned to Scotland in 1996. Edward was Edward never built stone castles on strategic sites in Scotland, as he had done successfully in Wales, possibly because he did not have the funds for another ambitious castle building programme. By 1297, Edward was facing the biggest crisis in his reign, and his commitments outweighed his resources. Chronic debts were incurred by wars against France. In Flanders, Gascony and Wales, as well as Scotland, the clergy were refusing to pay their share of the costs, with the Archbishop of Canterbury threatening excommunication. Parliament was reluctant to contribute to Edward's expensive and unsuccessful military policies. The Earls of Hereford and Norfolk refused to serve in Gascony, and the barons presented a formal statement of their grievances. In the end, Edward was forced to reconfirm the charters, including Magna Carta, to obtain the money he required. The Archbishop was eventually suspended in 1306, by the new Gascon Pope, Clement V. A truce was declared with France in 1297, followed by a peace treaty in 1303, under which the French king restored the Duchy of Gascony to Edward. In Scotland, Edward pursued a series of campaigns from 1298 onwards. William Wallace had risen in Balliol's name, and recovered most of Scotland, before being defeated by Edward at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298. Wallace escaped, only to be captured in 1305, allegedly by the treachery of a fellow Scot, and taken to London where he was executed. In 1304, Edward summoned a full parliament, in which arrangements for the settlement of Scotland were made. The new government in Scotland featured a council, which included Robert the Bruce. Bruce unexpectedly rebelled in 1306 by killing a fellow councillor and was crowned King of Scotland at Schoon. Despite his failing health, Edward was carried north to pursue another campaign, but he died en route to Burke on Sands on the 7th of July 1307. Age 68, he was, he was succeeded by his son, Edward II. According to chroniclers, Edward requested that his bones should be carried on to Scottish campaigns and that his heart be taken to the Holy Land. However, Edward was buried at Westminster Abbey in a plain black marble tomb, which in later years was painted with the words... Scotorum Malleus, Hammer of the Scots. Throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, the Exchequer paid to keep candles burning round the body of Lord Edward, formerly King of England, of famous memory. <laughs>